So <clears throat> Janet, unlike uh, Tijet, when I was uh, for uh, 15 years in Milano, is, um, is, um, is sponsored, is essentially funded by the French Teledon, which is the equivalent of the Italian Teledon, the difference being the amount of money that they collect, which is much more significant. But it's essentially the same thing. It's a charity, and it's focused on uh, 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 rare diseases. It, it was uh, originally uh, created in 1990 um, by the AFM. Well, the AFM is, now it's called AFM Teledon, but it's essentially, it was the French Muscular Dystrophy Association, which now focuses in general on rare genetic diseases. Um, at the beginning, Geneton started as a uh, part of the Human uh, Genome Project, and it actually had a very significant role there because it, it, it was uh, in uh, Geneton that the first uh, haplotype map of the human genome was, uh, uh, was uh, finished and published in Nature in uh, 1990 or 91, or something like that. Um, and eventually, in 95, uh, under the, uh, director, uh, the direction of uh, Olivier Danos, became uh, an institute of gene therapy. So it's a, it's a big thing, as you can see here. This is uh, the, uh, the research building, and plus, this is the uh, virus production building. I will give you a hint during my presentation of what is this uh, building for. Um, and as I said, it's completely funded, uh, almost completely funded by uh, the Teleton, and uh, it's uh, a non-profit organization uh, uh, dedicated to gene therapy of neuromuscular, blood, uh, CNS, and liver diseases. Um, Geneton is uh, a completely integrated organization. So uh, we do preclinical research, we do experiments in the laboratory, of course. We have animal platform for small animals, large animals, uh, a full GMP pharmaceutical establishment that can uh, produce uh, in GMP both lentiviral vectors and AAV of different serotypes. And uh, we have a network of uh, collaborations, uh, many of whom I'm sure you uh, know very well, um, for um, the clinical application of what we are doing. So in general, as I said, um, this is, these are essentially all the diseases uh, we are working on. And if you look at this pipeline, you can essentially say that this is completely crazy, which is what I said uh, the first time I stepped in. Um, and it's essentially uh, a big program on neuromuscular diseases, not surprisingly. This is the mission originally of Geneton. Um, something on liver, a big program of, uh, on uh, blood uh, genetic diseases. And uh, let's say um, other programs on the eye uh, and CNS diseases, which are essentially done in collaborations. But mo most of the effort and, and everything I will show you today is focused on the uh, neuromuscular program and the blood genetic uh, diseases program. I will start by, um, so what, what I will do is, is essentially give you um, an idea of what we are doing in, in these two fields. Um, and I selected a few stories that give you an idea of the type of approach and um, how likely it is that some of these um, therapies will uh, reach uh, um, the clinical phase um, soon or very soon, or they're already there. I will make a couple of examples in the field of muscular dystrophy, and in particular uh, Duchenne and uh, myotubular myopathy. And I will give you some examples in the field of uh, blood disorders, and in particular for some immunodeficiencies. So these are examples of uh, uh, in vivo gene therapy based on AAV essentially, and ex vivo based on uh, stem cells um, transduced by lentiviral vectors. So genetically corrected stem cells transplanted into patients. So let me start um, from the uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. As um, many of you, uh, probably most of you know uh, already, uh, this is the most uh, frequent uh, ma genetic muscular dystrophy in men, and it's due to deficiency of this uh, huge protein. It's called dystrophin or dystrophin, depending on what side of the Atlantic Ocean you, you live. Um, and uh, which, which is a, a big filamentous protein that is essentially a bridge uh, between the uh, contractile machinery of the muscle fibers and uh, the, um, the extracellular uh, extra fiber environment. So this multimolecular bridge, which goes through the uh, sarcolemma membrane, 
is important and it's important that it, that it is intact. If there, are, there is deficiency in any of this sarcoglygan or dystroglygan or dystrophin uh, proteins, uh, the, this uh, connection is disrupted. The muscle fibers degenerate and create and gives rise to uh, what we know as muscular dystrophies, which is a family. Uh, the Duchenne is due to deficiency of these proteins. There are many mutations, deletions, uh, point mutations. It's a collection of those. But essentially, the problem is that you don't have enough of this protein. So theoretically, an easy problem, you, uh, go, uh, you restore this protein synthesis and you uh, cure the disease, theoretically. Practically, it's extremely difficult for a number of reasons. The first is that the, the dystrophic... Uh, uh, phenotype, once it, it is established, is not reversible. Once you have lost your muscle function that is, and your muscle tissue that is replaced by, uh, by scar tissue, essentially by fibrotic tissues, there's no way you're going back. So uh, the only way is to prevent the degeneration, which means you have to go into uh, children. You have to go into early phases of the disease. The second is that this protein is huge. Uh, the, the DNA, the, the cDNA that can code uh, for it, not to mention the gene that is 2.5 megabases, uh, is very difficult to, uh, to transfer. Uh, and, uh, and the third, that it's the, 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 the muscle is most of our body mass. So you have to reach uh, in vivo an enormous amount of uh, target tissue. Uh, you cannot just uh, uh, target a stem cell. So altogether, this makes the most formidable uh, uh, challenge uh, for a gene therapy approach. And um, not surprisingly, very little has worked uh, up to date, except for the mouse model, which is uh, relatively easy to correct. So many years ago uh, at Genedon, uh, Luis Garcia and Olivier Danos uh, started working on a potential approach, uh, which is called uh, exon skipping. So uh, as I said, this is the, uh, the dystrophin protein is made of uh, and terminal domain, a carboxy terminal domain, and a very long road domain, which is a repeated thing. Um, and um, there are several mutations in several exons, but essentially when you have a mutation, one easy way to solve the problem without impairing the function of the protein is to skip uh, the exon or the exons that are mutated and essentially restore protein synthesis uh, by uh, uh, skipping the mutation. This is uh, theoretically feasible, in particular, uh, for instance, if you have a mutation in exon 53, uh, which accounts for 8% uh, of the mutation in, uh, in, in, in patients, um, you may think of uh, skipping these exons and bridging uh, exons upstream and downstream and restore the frame and, and the protein synthesis. Now, the shape of these little pieces here, each one of these is, is an exon, uh, gives you the idea uh, that uh, you have to put, of course, the, uh, everything back in frame. So uh, 43 uh, is in frame with 44, but not with 45. So there is a code here that you have to respect in order to, uh, to, to do something meaningful. So if, if you want to skip 53, the easiest way is to go from 51 to 54. And if you have a ways of skipping, uh, uh, of inducing exon skipping in the, in the primary transcript of the gene, this is theoretically feasible. And um, uh, what... Um, Luis and Olivier uh, uh, invented in essentially in the mid-2000 uh, uh, was to use um, as, a, as a way to induce skipping uh, a small uh, nuclear RNA uh, that's called U7. Um, I have absolutely no time to tell you everything uh, about this uh, little um, <coughs> RNA and what is its role. It's essentially uh, part of the uh, splicing machinery uh, of uh, histone mRNA, but it, it doesn't matter. It's essentially uh, an RNA that has a, a binding site for a SM protein, so it is targeted to the spliceosome. And if you can, if you build into this RNA an antisense part that it's uh, uh, complementary to part of what you want to skip, you essentially interfere with splicing, and you can cause uh, jumping and exon skipping. Uh, the proof of principle for this was given in, uh, in 2004 in this uh, seminal paper in, in, in science in which they showed that um, uh, delivering this to a muscle in the, in, uh, in the mouse model of uh, muscular dystrophies, the MDX mouse, um, skipping exon 23 in this case in the mouse, 
was feasible, and this restored uh, protein synthesis in, in most of the mass culture. So it was really very interesting paper. More recently, um, uh, the group of Philippe Boulier, together with other people at Geneton, uh, uh, transferred this type of technology into the dark model, which is much more difficult to correct. It's much more similar to the human pathology than, than, the, than the X mouse is. Um, essentially showing um, by intramuscular injection uh, uh, essentially the same thing. So you can restore uh, the dystrophin synthesis, which is this uh, uh, green ring, um, into a GRM and D uh, dogs. It's a golden retriever muscular dystrophy, it's called, uh, and restore uh, protein synthesis by skipping, uh, in this case, uh, exon 6, uh, uh, exon 8. So how does it work in the, in the, in the dog? This is the, the model I will show you um, uh, rapidly. Uh, there is a mutation, this is a, natu a natural model. In the dog, uh, it's a natural mutation. Uh, and uh, the mutation is here, and uh, essentially uh, uh, creates, uh, uh, interferes with splicing, and essentially creates uh, two uh, RNAs, uh, uh, this one and this one, um, which cause premature end of translation. So you, you essentially there's no protein synthesis. Um, there is some exon skipping uh, naturally occurring and residual protein synthesis, so the, 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 the dog is not completely naive for the protein, but essentially it has a phenotype, so it's a dystrophic phenotype. What we can do, we can do is, uh, is uh, using U7 to uh, couple exon 6 and uh, exon 8 uh, to um, essentially introduce uh, a skipping <coughs> and go from uh, from, um, and create a skipping between 9 and 10, um, uh, I'm sorry, 5 and either 9 or 10. This is an alternative splicing that occurs naturally. And uh, obtain these two types of RNAs, um, delta 6, 7, 8, or delta 6, 7, 8, 9, which are both in frame and both code for the protein. So this is doable, um, can be done by creating um, uh, U7 RNAs uh, model to these exons. Uh, these are here. Uh, and these two RNAs are both uh, transcribed uh, within uh, an AAV vector. So they're, they're both in the same vector. Of course, these are very small uh, genes. Um, and this can be uh, packaged uh, into uh, serotype uh, 8, for instance, which is very good for, uh, for muscle, like other serotypes, um, and uh, um, injected into the dogs. Uh, I make a parenthesis just to, um, I know that some of you are involved in AAV uh, biology for sure, and maybe also um, uh, synthesis and production. And of course, this is a very crucial aspect when you want to uh, go into a large animal model and of course in patients. So you have to produce uh, very significant doses. And what uh, was developed during the years uh, at Genedon is uh, a system based on uh, baculoviruses, which again, I don't have the time to um, to describe you in the details, but essentially it's a, a, a virus that produces another virus. So it's based on the two uh, uh, baculos, one that codes for rep and cap and the other that codes for the uh, transgene, in our case the U7. Uh, these two uh, uh, viruses are produced in uh, SF9 cells um, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in bioreactors essentially through an, a number of steps. Uh, but the bottom line is that you can use uh, industry type of uh, technology with this Sartorius uh, big boys of uh, twin of 200 uh, liters each um, uh, bioreactors that produce uh, very high doses of uh, AAV uh, in GMP ready for clinical use. So this is the type of uh, stuff that we use for dogs. And just to give you an idea of why this is important, um, to produce the dose of AAV8 uh, uh, that is necessary to treat the first cohort of 30 patients, which is the clinical trials that uh, it is planned um, by Geneton and uh, the Institute of Myology in Paris, <coughs> we, we would essentially uh, need 1,000 liters of culture with the standard cell factory based transfection technology, which is a pile of almost 200 meters. This is the La Tour Montparnasse in the, in the center of Paris which is 200 meters. Um, and the time that it takes to produce this is approximately three years. Uh, you can do ex exactly the same things in one uh, run of 200 liters with Baculo in one bioreactors and produce essentially the same dose in six weeks. So this is the type of uh, uh, technological uh, uh, upgrade uh, uh, in, in, in the production of these things that 
makes the difference between something that is theoretically feasible but practically almost impossible and something that uh, can be done. Uh, going back to the to science, uh, this is essentially shows that in the dogs, uh, the exon skipping uh, can work uh, untreated and, and, uh, and treated muscles. These are muscle biopsies. These, uh, oh, I'm sorry, this is the in vitro uh, potency assays. These essentially are myoblasts taken by the, the dog. This is an in vivo potency assay. This shows exactly the same thing. But you can see here, these are the skipped um, uh, RNAs and these are the unskipped RNAs. This is essentially bottom line dose dependent and uh, and works. Higher dose, higher skipping, lower dose, lower skipping. This can be done in uh, in dogs, as I said. Uh, the AV is uh, in is um, uh, injected um, by a technology is called isolated limb perfusion. Uh, it's essentially uh, a tourniquet that you apply to uh, the um, forward limb of one of these uh, pure animals. This is not the GRMD dogs, it's another type of uh, dogs that I will show you uh, in 10 minutes, but it's essentially the same technology. You can essentially use a pump to uh, apply the AAV uh, into the circulation into this uh, limb that is uh, uh, blocked um, with a certain uh, pressure, a certain flow rate, everything has been standardized, and, uh, and, the, and the vector comes from uh, the process that I described that includes uh, purification and affinity columns. Whoever uh, is interested in this, uh, I can give you details uh, uh, after my presentation. So this is injected in the dog, and of course, um, uh, just to let you know, this is a technology that is uh, completely usable in patients, and actually is even published uh, a clinical trial uh, in volunteers, uh, in volunteer patients of uh, Duchenne has been injected with saline. Um, and just to show that this is possible, that of course the leg uh, swells quite a bit. The volume that is injected is very significant, but uh, very rapidly goes back to the normal volume and with zero complication for the patient. So this is practically feasible. This is the route of administration that we will follow in uh, our patients injecting virus and not uh, salted water. Um, the tourniquet, if, if you are good at doing this, if you are a good surgeon, um, works relatively well. This is the biodistribution of the uh, vector in the muscles uh, below the tourniquet and above the tourniquet or the contralateral legs. And as you can see, uh, the, uh, the, the most of the uh, all the muscles in, in the injected leg are uh, transduced at, uh, uh, with a variable uh, vector copy number. The dose that has been administered is 2.5, 10 to the 13 VG per kg, which is a very significant dose, as you uh, may uh, understand. Um, this shows that the exon skipping occurs uh, in vivo. Uh, at the maximum dose, you have a very efficient skipping. At one-fifth of the dose, you have skipping, but less efficiently, and in, uh, and in some tissues this doesn't happen. Of course, uh, the more you apply, uh, the more you leak into the rest of the body, so uh, not surprisingly for, for the maximal dose, we have transduction of the heart, the diaphragm, and other muscles, and uh, when you reduce the dose, essentially only the injected leg uh, is transduced and skips the axon. One-tenth of the dose, you start uh, losing the axon skipping. So it, this is dose dependent, and finding the dose is, is crucial. This shows the same thing at the level of percentage of uh, fibers expressing <coughs> dystrophy, maximal dose. You have expression in the contralateral lib or in other muscles. Uh, uh, one fifth of the dose is essentially restricted to the injected lib. One tenth of the dose, you go beyond the, uh, the percentage of fibers that are uh, uh, therapeutic. So this is the dose that you need to use, at least in the dog. This gives you an idea. Uh, doesn't show very well, but um, essentially, transduction is very efficient. Uh, um, I'll show you some examples of functional tests that are done on these dogs, which I think is interesting. I'm actually fascinated by how many things you can do in dogs that you, that you can do in patients, uh, and you can uh, essentially test in, in, in dogs. One of this is uh, NMR. NMR. So uh, by doing this uh, proton NMR analysis, this is a, a sort of a... Um, 
uh, functional in vivo, non-invasive uh, test. And uh, if, when you do an MMR um, on, uh, on, uh, on, the, on the muscle of a normal dog, this is the type of pattern that you get. This is a transvexial uh, section, if I uh, can say this. Um, in, a, in a dystrophic dog, you have this very strong white signal that uh, essentially shows that the metabolism there is completely altered. And, uh, uh, and, and, and you have a signal that you're not supposed to have in the normal musculature. And you can use the same, the, the same type of readout, which is transposable to humans. Actually, this is a, a clinical MMR machine, um, to, uh, to look at what happens in the treated dogs. And, and, and as you see, the, the, the treated legs of dog one, two, and three uh, has essentially, uh, have essentially a pattern that is reminiscent of the normal animals and not of the uh, dystrophic animals. Uh, a second readout that is also very useful uh, is, uh, for, and, and very relevant in, in terms of uh, clinical um, reconstitution of function is, of course, uh, uh, force recovery. So in these dogs, which are injected uh, relatively early in the course of the disease, so they're approximately at uh, three months of age, um, uh, you can um, measure, the dog here is in, uh, under anesthesia, and, uh, and the measurement is done by uh, uh, inducing uh, contraction by electric st stimulation. And, and there are machines that have been developed that can essentially measure force, um, uh, uh, contraction-induced uh, uh, force. And, and this is, I think, a, 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 an interesting piece of, uh, of results that are obtained in these animals, because if this is the type of results that you uh, get in, uh, and the numbers here, as you see, are, are significant. Many dogs have been treated in, in this preclinical uh, assay. Uh, if you have less than 10% of the dystrophin-positive fibers, essentially you have no effect. The, the, the dystrophy progresses, the dog doesn't recover any force, and, uh, and, uh, and, and this, is, this is the result. Um, this is uh, what you have if you have between 10 and 40% uh, of uh, dystrophin uh, expressing fibers. And this is what you get when you go above 40% uh, uh, of uh, uh, dystrophin positive fibers. This type of assay allows to predict that in order to, be, to reach therapeutic levels of uh, dystrophin expression, um, certainly in dogs, most likely in patients, this is the level that you have to achieve. So the threshold is very high. You have to achieve at least 40% of the fibers uh, in the target muscle in order to stop dystrophic progression and to essentially have a benefit in terms of re a recovery of force. Um, for those of you that are interested in immunology, I'm going very fast because otherwise I will never uh, uh, finish today. Um, the uh, injection of AV8, of course, uh, this, these dogs are naive for AV8. Um, of course, causes uh, 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 and the appearance of uh, uh, neutralizing antibodies and neutralizing activity in the serum against AV8 uh, uh, almost immediately uh, after injection. Um, uh, the um, the uh, IgG um, uh, response is, uh, is persistent. The uh, um, uh, other responses are not. Again, uh, don't, I won't go into the details. Um, but essentially, uh, this is not something that you can repeat. And this is another challenge of this type of therapies in humans. You have to realize that one, once you reach this type of level of uh, uh, specific neutralizing activity in the serum, there's no way you're going to re-inject again uh, the same serotype in a dog, in a monkey, or in a patient. So um, in, in planning clinical trials, you have to take into account that you will not have the luxury of repeating the type of treatment in the same patient. Um, just to give you an idea of the, this, this story, as you understand, this started many years ago, and it's going progressively towards a clinical trial. Um, we are approximately, uh, approximately here uh, with the clinical protocol ready, a natural history study done. Um, a number of things uh, done, uh, the GMP production already done. Uh, we do expect, we do hope to uh, be uh, able to uh, treat patients at the end of next year. Um, just to give you uh, a clue of what are the alternatives. Of course, as I said, uh, skipping extra 53 sounds interesting, but it's 
less than 10% of the patients, what do you do with the rest of the patients? Uh, of course, you can theoretically think of uh, devising uh, exon skipping molecules for almost any exons, but certainly you can't do much if you have a large gene deletion, which accounts for more than one third of the uh, uh, mutations uh, in, in humans. Um, and, uh, and I'm not sure that it will be practically feasible to, to design uh, uh, exon skipping strategies for, for, for everything. So um, uh, there are other possible strategies. As I said, the gene is very big, uh, but the, the cDNA is huge, uh, and it cannot be possibly uh, put into a, an AAV. Um, but um, many years ago, Jeff Chamberlain and George Dixon designed a number of molecules that essentially are completely, uh, very much reduced and uh, almost completely devoid of the uh, uh, internal uh, rod domain. They also, they only uh, have the uh, N terminal, um, uh, C terminal and a few exons of the rod domain. So these are called micro dystrophins or mini dystrophins. And they essentially work, uh, even if, if it uh, reduced, uh, with reduced efficiency with respect to the normal molecule. Now, this thing can be put into a vector. So um, and essentially what I will show you in the next slides is what you can restore um, in terms of um, all the parameters that I showed you before by using uh, a synthetic promoter, uh, muscle-specific strong promoter, and this small RNA coding for this uh, uh, microdystrophin over here. Again, the serotype is, uh, is 2.8. And um, um, a few years ago, George Dixon showed that in the MDX mouse, um, this protein works very well. Uh, this is the size of the protein compared to the normal dystrophy. It's really much smaller. And you can normalize uh, tissue turnover, reverse uh, um, uh, the dystrophic phenotype in the MDX, normalize muscle force, normalize res uh, resistance to eccentric contraction, a number of parameters. So in the mouse, this works. But I must say that almost everything works in the mouse. So what happens when you put this in the dog? Uh, the dog is much more challenging. Um, so we, we decided to use the same uh, dog. And these experiments started last year. So they're relatively recent. Nothing is published. Um, we, we started with a vector dose that is one-tenth of what we use for, uh, for the uh, exon skipping based on uh, in vitro assay that shows that essentially this, uh, this this vector is more efficient. A producing protein is more efficient than, than skipping exons. Um, and essentially, the, the dog went through uh, the very same uh, procedure. Uh, and this is the type of result. So uh, these are the three dogs that have been injected local regionally. And, uh, and these are uh, three uh, uh, mass, mass, actually two dogs in, in three different muscles. Uh, and as you see, uh, as you can see here, the percentage of fibers that uh, are, um, that are positive for dystrophin in these animals is very, very high. And this just to give you an idea uh, by immunofluorescence, which is, makes a nicer picture. Um, a number of parameters show that this is functionally relevant. Um, a myosin, developmental myosin heavy chain is something that labels fibers when the turnover is very, uh, is very high. So when you have a lot of labeling, means that these fibers are dying and are, and are regenerated very often. Uh, after treatment, this turnover uh, goes uh, down to uh, 2% rather than 20%. So uh, very good data. Uh, fibrosis, which in the dog is part of the phenotype, is very much reduced. And this is just a qualitative assessment of this. Uh, NMR spectroscopy gives the same type of results. So uh, again, uh, the uh, treated muscle look much more like the uh, wild type than uh, uh, the dystrophic uh, muscle. And in terms of a percentage of uh, predicted strength that is recovered, uh, so, so strength increases in this uh, treated animal. Uh, these are the untreated. These are the treated limbs. Uh, in, in the same animal, and this is uh, uh, very significant. And this, we are talking about uh, experiments done uh, up to eight months after uh, infusion. And uh, uh, the immunology, this is also important because we, here we are expressing, a, if you wish, an artificial protein. And the issue uh, uh, whether this can, can cause rejection is a, is a crucial issue. Um, these are all cytokines that essentially show that uh, uh, the response uh, is not it's not particularly predictive in, the, in this uh, animal. So uh, Fiasco is an uh, untreated 
uh, animal um, uh, which is uh, in yellow in, in all these things. And the treated animal, with the exception of one, essentially show uh, the same pattern. The treated animal uh, are these three. Uh, besides learning French, uh, uh, I had to learn also who are these guys here. And honestly, I didn't know them before. Um, but the, the, the kids that are working with, uh, with dogs are, uh, use names that are very romantic. Um, anyway, the only one that showed some cytokine response was this old guy here, Halbus. But he, he had the bronchopneumonia, so most likely that's an inflammatory response not caused by the, uh, by the vector. And most importantly, the, by two different approaches, there is no evidence of cytotoxic T-cell-mediated immune response against the fibers, which is the most important thing as far as uh, we uh, are concerned. Um, uh, I don't have the time to show you this data, so you, you, you need to believe me. Uh, so just to conclude, uh, there are two approaches that we can use to treat muscular dystrophy. One that is very close to the clinics, uh, which is the exon skipping. This other one that is uh, going very fast and um, uh, honestly, I think, very promising. The difference is that theoretically, a micro dystrophy can be used in any patient. And exon skipping is limited to patient uh, exons that can be skipped. Um, I don't have particularly preference for one or the other approach. I think that only uh, clinical trials will tell us uh, whether or not this has a chance to uh, be beneficial in these um, uh, little patients. So let me uh, spend uh, um, the last um, 20 minutes or so by giving you an idea of at least another um, model of neuromuscular disease, and then what we are doing in, in the blood disease is that, as I told you, uh, is a, a, the, the second big part of what we are doing. This other disease, which very few uh, people know, it's extremely rare, it's called myotubular myopathy. It's an interesting disease because it's not a dystrophy, um, which gives us the, 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 the hope that these patients can be treated. Uh, it's a deficiency of an enzyme. Uh, which is called uh, MTM1. Uh, it's a lipid phosphatase. It's very crucial to muscle function. In the absence of this enzyme, uh, uh, well, patients essentially die. So null uh, patients uh, don't survive the second year of life, uh, essentially die by complete respiratory failure. Uh, those with residual protein levels survive longer, <coughs> but they have zero uh, motor function and they normally go uh, into uh, ventilation, assisted ventilation at the age of three, four. So it's an extremely severe disease. Uh, survival is, uh, is uh, the, the life expectancy does not exceed 10 years in the, in the, in the best cases. Um, the, the, the fibers, the muscle essentially does not develop and does not contract. So it's there, it's not a dystrophic, uh, muscle, so it does not degenerate. It's simply not working well uh, because of the uh, absence of this uh, enzyme. And as a very characteristic phenotype, so it's the central nucleation of very small fibers. To make a long story short, um, Anna bush uh, a scientist uh, at, uh, in Geneton, um, a few years ago developed a mouse model, actually more than one, and, and I don't have the time to show you all the genetics uh, of this assays, which is extremely interesting, and just showing one, one, one of these models. Um, this is a knockout. Uh, and uh, essentially, uh, in the red line, this is how the, the mice behave. The mouse uh, reproduces very well the human phenotype. These mice uh, are severely impaired in their uh, muscle, skeletal muscle function. They all die very soon. Um, if you uh, give a tail vein injection of this dose of AV8 encoding uh, MTM1 under uh, the Desmin uh, promoter, which is muscle specific, you rescue 100% of the animals. Um, not only you rescue these animals, but, uh, but you can rescue these animals even if you inject here. So you, you not, not only you can prevent the disease by injecting in the first two weeks of life, but you can stop progression and rescue completely the animals if you inject later, when the disease has uh, already uh, started. Um, uh, this is weight. This is the uh, wild-type animal. This is the knockout treated with AV. This is the knockout untreated. I don't need to uh, explain that this is a complete cure in the animal. 
Um, for this um, disease, there exists a uh, adult model, uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's now at the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, this is the group of uh, uh, Casey Childers that work with these animals, and when Anna uh, started the collaboration with them, uh, they essentially uh, put together everything we already know about uh, uh, isolated limb perfusion in this, uh, th this Labrador dogs. These are black dogs, uh, the one that you, uh, you have seen before. So again, we, we essentially did the same thing. This is an AV8 produced in Baculo uh, that expresses uh, um, MTM1 under the uh, lesbian promoter. And uh, what you uh, uh, assess in these animals is, is here. Um, the known treated dogs have to be euthanized uh, before 16 weeks. They don't survive. I, I will show you the phenotype in, in a moment. Um, and this is very homogeneous. It, it, they all die. Well, actually, you have to uh, euthanize them. Uh, um, and the, um, the, the question here was, can we rescue uh, muscle function by this type of injection? Um, fortunately for us, uh, the Americans are not very good at applying tourniquets. So as you will see uh, in a moment, this, uh, this isolated limb perfusion turned out to be not very isolated. And we essentially injected almost systemically this, this uh, uh, dose. Many of this went into one leg, but after 10 minutes, you release the tourniquet and whatever is left goes around. Um, before giving you uh, the idea of the blood program, let me uh, acknowledge the gigantic group of people that is doing uh, all this research. It's half of Genetone, basically. Uh, let me acknowledge Thomas Voigt, is the director of the Institute of Myology, the clinics in which this is done, where all the physicians are, where the patients are treated, where the gene therapy trial will be done. Uh, Philippe Moulier uh, was the uh, scientific director of Genito for a little less than two years before uh, I came, and is still the PI in the exon skipping study. Uh, George Dixon uh, uh, is at UCL in London and is the, the, the PI of the microdystrophin study. Uh, Caroline Leguinet and Nant uh, works with the uh, dystrophic dogs, and Anna Bushbello uh, works uh, with the uh, myotubular myopathy uh, project, and she's the project leader. And the, uh, the group of Casey Childer uh, in Seattle uh, helped us for uh, power off, oh no, um, with this. So, blood. Um, well, as you know, this is a completely different thing. So we don't inject viruses. It's not an AV. We uh, genetically manipulate stem cells, and we inject genetically manipulated stem cells. I'm sure that I don't have to tell you what this is. Uh, we use uh, lentiviral vectors for transducing stem cells. This is the type of uh, gene therapy that um, uh, Mauro was kind enough to uh, remind you. This is where the whole field started in the early 90s uh, with adenosine deaminase deficiencies. Now, there are many diseases that are treated essentially the same approach. You get uh, C34 uh, progenitor cells from the bone marrow or peripheral blood um, from patients. You transduce them in vitro with uh, retroviral vector or lentiviral vectors, uh, whatever, and, and then you uh, transplant them back into patients with or without conditioning, and if uh, you can you're good at transducing stem cells, you get uh, uh, gene transfer and gene expression in the lineages that you want to target. So uh, uh, I show you this slide um, to give you an idea of uh, what, in, um, uh, what, what many people think was a failure of gene therapy, and essentially was the, um, the trials, uh, trials, there are many, for severe combined immunodeficiency, two types, ADA deficiency and uh, gamma, common gamma receptor deficiency. There are many groups that were involved in this. Um, uh, our group in, in Milan <coughs> at the time, Marina Cavazzana and Alain Fischer in Paris, Adrian Trasher, Bobby Gasper in London, Dan Cohn in Los Angeles, uh, <laughs> David Williams and Gigi Rotarangelo in Boston. And altogether, since 1991, 72 patients have been treated for all this type of diseases, and all with the same approach retroviral vectors, not lentiviral vectors, coding for either the ADA gene or the XKID gene. Now, nothing happened in the ADA gene. The patients were all cured. This was a clear history of success. Uh, but the other uh, therapy is also a history of success. 
despite the uh, sort of uh, bad publicity that the occurrence of five leukemias due to insertion of oncogenesis uh, caused in these patients. The numbers are here, 72 patients treated, 52 patients were completely cured. This is a lethal disease, and these patients are alive and well, which is a 72% efficacy for a lethal disease, okay, which is, I think, any therapy for any lethal disorders with this type of numbers would be considered a fantastic success in, the, in medicine, and I think it is. Uh, five patients experienced, uh, as you probably know, uh, leukemia due to insertion of oncogenesis, which is 7% morbidity if you consider all the patients. One patient died, the other four were treated and are still doing well, So, which, which is a mortality of 1.4. The alternative for these patients, if they don't have a donor, is either die or have a, a mismatched bone marrow transplant with a mortality between 25 and 45%. So this is the type of results that gene therapy shows. Of course, the vectors are not perfect. Of course, we don't want to cause insertion or oncogenesis. And well, this is the same thing. Uh, uh, this is the survival of it after 10 years of these patients. And these are the uh, in insertions into one oncogene, essentially, that caused the leukemias in four patients in Paris and one in London. Something causes leukemia in Paris more often than London, and we don't understand why. So what we know, uh, of course, these days is that um, retroviruses have different preferences. Um, Moroni leukemia viruses tend to go into uh, regulatory elements of gene. They hit regulatory elements. They hijack, essentially, regulation of genes by using their own uh, regulatory elements. Uh, and this is, of course, is, uh, is a, a type of vector that is very much prone to cause upregulation of genes. And if these genes are proto-oncogenes, this might have a consequence. Lentiviral vectors, on the other hand, have completely different uh, characteristics. <coughs> they tend to go into, not in promoters and regulatory elements, but here in blue, into the transcribed portion of genes, so essentially into exons, away from regulatory elements. So from the, simply at looking at the integration characteristics, you can predict that this would be uh, much safer vectors, and so far they are in the clinical applications that we know. So uh, while in the case of Moroni leukemia virus uh, derived vectors, the, uh, the problem and the risk factor is due by, uh, uh, as I said, upregulation of genes, so it is a dominant molecular event. In the case of lentiviral vectors self-inactivated with uh, cellular promoters away from regulatory elements, probably you, the, the, the frequency of having this type of events is, is much, much lower. All this was proven, in, of course, in vitro and animal models. I'm not just predicting things here. Uh, there are other problems for this vector, which is called, uh, they are prone to induce uh, alternative splicing and premature termination, which is one of the problems that need to be addressed. But altogether, all the preclinical models that we have show that lentiviral vectors are much safer into uh, human hematopoietic uh, stem cells or mouse hematopoietic stem cells or monkey hematopoietic stem cells. So uh, what we're doing um, now um, at Geneton uh, is to uh, rebuild um, the, uh, the vector for the X uh, skid, um, the IL-2 uh, uh, common gamma receptor into the framework of uh, self-inactivating uh, lentiviral vectors with uh, elongation factor one alpha promoter. Uh, that has uh, excellent uh, genotoxic characteristics. And uh, this will be uh, another clinical trial which will be carried out again in London and Paris by the same clinical groups. And we hope to be ready to do this starting in 2015. The last two things, um, I would probably show only one because uh, uh, we are really running out of time. The last thing that I will show you is something that is already in the clinic. And it's an application of a lentiviral vector, and it's for this uh, type of disease. It's called Wiskott Aldrich syndrome. Um, this is another immunodeficiency, X linked. Uh, um, it has multiple symptoms. Um, it is due to lack of this protein. Uh, it, it's called Wiskott Aldrich uh, syndrome protein, which is a, a cytoskeletal component, which is particularly important for uh, uh, supporting the, uh, uh, immuno the so called immunologic synapse. So it, Lack of this protein is, is deleterious for uh, T cells, for, for B cells, for a number of other cells, including platelets. Um, and so the result is an immune deficiency with a lot of other problems. 
um, it's normally treated by transplantation of allogeneic uh, stem cells from fully compatible donors uh, when you have them. And normally this is less than one third of the patients. For the others, there is no cure. Um, these are the, uh, the symptoms. The eczema is really a, a hallmark of this disease. <coughs> what has been developed, this was done, um, uh, I, I followed the development of this from both sides of the Alps. So this was uh, uh, started when I was in, uh, um, in Milano uh, as a collaboration between the two teledons. So TJET and, and, and Genedon, and now I'm the, on the other side to, to finish this. But um, it's essentially an antiviral vector with the WAS cDNA and the WAS promoter. This is a, a design that, as I said, was developed by um, the, the two groups together, um, and essentially uh, with the help of uh, uh, Avian Thrasher. So this, uh, uh, this is a rather big uh, gene, uh, rather big cassette. Um, this was developed as a, as a full antiviral vectors. All kinds of preclinical studies was done, and I don't have the time to, uh, to, 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 to tell you this, so I will just go very fast, but in, uh, in a very good, uh, let's say, validated in vitro assay of genotoxicity, um, this vector scores exactly like non-transduced cells as opposed to other vectors that uh, score mm -hmm. positive in this in vitro induction of uh, uh, chronogenic expansion, which was developed by Chris Baum uh, a few years ago, uh, and it's now a standard. <coughs> the same happens in vivo. And now this is a, it's a clinical trial. It started already. Um, in, uh, in London, two patients have been treated already. In, uh, in, uh, in Paris, four patients have been treated. And uh, at the uh, Children's Hospital in, uh, in Boston, um, patients have been enrolled but not treated yet. And everything is uh, sponsored and coordinated by Geneton. And the vector is produced in Paris and sent to all uh, the centers. Um, I don't know how many of you are interested in this type of details, but of course, patients are um, uh, treated before infusion of uh, genetically modified cells uh, with rather, I would say, conventional uh, chemotherapy. Um, um, this is the trial. Um, the enrollment criteria are severe patients, so a very high clinical score. Uh, primary objectives needed to say safety. This is phase one, two, but also engraftment and reconstitution of immunity and uh, thrombocytopenia, which is very uh, uh, dangerous in these patients. Uh, clinical protocol is, is the usual. Again, I, I'll skip this. Cells are activated, transduced with the vector, uh, reinfused into the patients. Uh, let me show you just some uh, data, and I will finish here, <clears throat> that uh, are unpublished and uh, uh, are due to the courtesy of Marina that gave me this slide. So this is the uh, clinical results of the uh, first patients. I must say that the same trial is uh, carried out. I mean, the same trial, a very similar trial with the same vector is carried out at the same time uh, at TJET by Alessandro Aiuti. He also treated six patients. Results are very much comparable. So this is very reassuring, uh, very safe uh, in all cases, and uh, clinical efficacy is already obviously there. So this is the recovery of T lymphocytes in the four uh, French patients, uh, which looks uh, very good. We go from a uh, very low level of T cells. These are B lymphocytes, uh, these are NK cells, so you, we, you have recovery of everything, including uh, NK cells, and uh, you have recovery of uh, uh, platelets. I don't think I have, no, I don't have the slides. Uh, platelet recovery is much slower, but uh, is, uh, uh, is essentially there uh, between eight months and 12 months after transplantation. And vector copy number, this is important, uh, so this, type of therapeutic uh, uh, efficacy is obtained if you count how many copies per cells are in peripheral blood of these patients at a vector copy number that is uh, uh, very reassuring. Uh, essentially, the crude vector copy number is uh, uh, lower than uh, one. Uh, transduction level is between 30 and 40 percent, which means that on average, these cells contain between one and three copies of the vector. So this is what is the therapeutic level uh, apparently for this type of vector and this type of disease. Uh, I will skip um, uh, the, the last trial because I'm, I'm sure that you're already uh, pretty much dead. So just let me go to the uh, acknowledgements um, uh, for, for the second part. Uh, and as I said, uh, all this is done again by an enormous number of people that includes uh, 
many people in Geneton, and particularly Angali, I have to, uh, to, to say she's the, the project leader, and she was really instrumental in developing this whole machine, and particularly the production process, which is working beautifully. Uh, and uh, um, uh, people in Hanover that helped us uh, to, uh, for the preclinical studies, uh, as I said, this was developed together with uh, TJET, in particular with uh, uh, Alessandro Iuti, and the uh, clinicians that are doing this, um, which are um, uh, in, in Paris, in London, at Children's Hospital. And let me also mention uh, uh, Rick Bushman, who is helping us to, uh, in analyzing with very fancy type of technology, uh, the uh, dynamics of the engrafted stem cells uh, into these patients. I think I will stop here. If you have uh, any question, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>